Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this conversation about shockproofing food security in Africa, a food system approach. A special welcome to those of you joining us um, remotely. Um, thank you. Apologies for starting a little late. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, partnership um, for this particular program um, with the African Union's Development Agency and also UNDP's Food and Agricultural Commodity Systems Unit. Today we will be looking at um, creative approaches to shockproofing food security in Africa. We know that Africa is susceptible to um, shocks, some caused by climate change. Um, we know that about uh, 60, 70 years ago, the shock cycle in Africa was about 12 every 12 years. Today it is half that amount of time, which means that households and communities hardly have time to recover from one climate related shock before they have to contend with another. Second shocks are global shocks, including commodity price shocks, and most recently the war in Ukraine. And we believe that um, shockproofing food security in Africa is a development imperative. It's not just about food availability um, supply. Today we'll be hearing from um, very distinguished speakers about creative and innovative ways to address this particular challenge. So we um, want to move beyond the rhetoric and focus a little bit more on practical and concrete um, solutions. Um, if you're joining us online, um, please um, record your questions, comments in the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to, as we go along, um, direct these to our distinguished speakers and panelists. Um, in the interest of time, I will not be providing extensive um, introductions for our speakers, um, but uh, at this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, my Assistant Secretary General and Director of the Regional Bureau for Africa at UNDP, Ms. Ahuna Ezia Konwa, to deliver some opening remarks. Ahuna. Thank you so much, uh, Raymond, and uh, a warm, Good morning to all of you uh, and welcome to New York for those who flew, bust, trained it in uh, for this event. I was just talking to the Honorable Minister from Liberia and she just flew in this morning. Um, so this is uh, the how serious the subject matter uh, that we're talking about here is. So let me say distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, I want to recognize uh, my dear sister, Nardos Bekele, who is the first female CEO of the Africa Union uh, Development Agency, uh, used to be called NEPAD, and is still sort of retaining that identity. Uh, I also want to formally recognize Honorable Janine Millie Cooper, the Minister of Agriculture for the Republic of Liberia, and His Excellency Abderrahman um, Wasame, the Special Presidential Envoy uh, for Drought Response from the Federal Republic of Somalia. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, we have our dear brother, uh, my brother from another mother, uh, Travis Adkins, CEO US Africa Development Foundation, and all the panelists that will be introduced to you later who are going to actually give you the meat of this topic. Mine is just to kick it off with a few words of introduction. And the topic, shockproofing food security in Africa, a food systems approach is what we are gathered here to talk about. Uh, and I think food insecurity is often discussed in the context of crises, uh, such as drought, wars, and it's particularly true in Africa that when we talk about food security, we often look at it in the 
sort of food assistance context. However, the, the war that is still going on in Europe has caused steep reductions in food imports to African countries. Uh, we've seen wheat imports in Africa estimated to decline by almost 12% this year, compared to say, for instance, the last two years uh, average. And the African households are burdened with much higher food prices, an increase of 13% between 2021 and 2022. While the fallout from the war in Ukraine is stark, we recognize that this is not the first time the continent has experienced a food crisis. A complex array of underlying long-term structural issues prevents Africa from feeding itself. At the heart of these challenges is the continent's lack of food sovereignty. And I want to underline that. This includes not only the right of people to have enough healthy food, but also the right to define and control their own food systems. As stated in the uh, declaration of uh, Nyeleni, the first global forum on this topic, which was held in Mali in 2007, I don't know if any of you would remember that, food sovereignty, and I quote, puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies, rather than the demands of markets and corporations. Africa is clearly not at this stage yet. According to the World Food Program, 278 million people in Africa are food insecure, being that they have limited or inadequate access to a sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food. Addressing food insecurity in Africa will require much more than ad hoc programs that we currently see that address external shocks, uh, such as the war in Ukraine or responding to the humanitarian crisis like drought or violent conflict. These have been the main ways in which we've been dealing with food crisis in Africa. African countries require a strategic overhaul of food systems, which includes the full range of actors and interactions involved in food protection, in processing, in marketing, and of course, in consumption. A number of African countries and institutions are already taking steps in this direction, thankfully. Uh, for example, the African Emergency Food Production Facility is working to increase the production of climate adapted wheat, corn, rice, and soybeans by providing 20 million African smallholders, uh, smallholder farmers with certified seeds to rapidly produce 38 metric tons of food in the next two years. The Africa Adaptation Initiative is developing a pipeline of bankable agricultural projects in Africa and the Africa Risk Capacities, Africa Disaster Risk Financing Program supports African governments to respond to food systems shocks by increasing access to risk insurance products. And while commodity price fluctuations and the global shocks are very likely to persist in the coming years, there are concrete steps that could indeed be taken to shockproof African communities and Country. So I don't share some of the pessimism that some people have when we talk about this topic. In the case of Africa, I actually think that we have opportunities to transform and steps are already being taken, not yet sufficient, but at least we've got some green shoots coming up that we can build on. The first and most important step is to boost supply including through diversification, cultivating indigenous and climate resilient crops, and by also supporting agroecological practices to make up for fertilizer shortages. Second, immediate steps should be taken to enhance food affordability and accessibility, 
Time bound and temporary subsidies could be part of an immediate response. And of course, that could target social protection programs that could restore ecosystem services and climate resilient, uh, um, climate resilience for agriculture. However, a more strategic approach would be to promote efficiency gains and also pass the savings on to the consumers. Right now, savings are being passed to the big corporates. This could take the form of significantly reducing food loss and food waste in post-production stages. The third is that African countries must invest in resilient institutional and regulatory frameworks that would be able to withstand external shocks. And of course, fourth is African countries have to prioritize intra-Africa trade. And the Africa continental free trade area provides an ideal platform to facilitate securities, thereby ensuring food sovereignty by reducing the continent's dependency on external sources of food supply. So Africa is a rich country, continent. We all keep saying that. And many of us have grown up learning about Africa's potential. And we're quite fed up. We're just talking about its potential. Um, we're also fed up with just managing poverty. And that is what a lot of our engagement has been about. When we deal with Africa, it's been largely about managing poverty. I think it's time to really solve this paradox that is building domestic productive capacity and nowhere is this more important than in Africa's food systems. Ensuring an accessible, affordable, and healthy food system will serve as a solid foundation for meeting the rest of the SDGs. But I think more importantly, even as we talk about industrialization, human development, and economic growth, it will transform us and translate us into this idea of going from managing poverty to creating shared prosperity. We think that this is what development has to be about. And I, I will end with an African proverb, which states that, and I quote, you cannot work for food when there is no food for work, end of quote. Our continent's development is linked with its ability to feed itself. For too long, Africa has consumed what it doesn't grow and grows what it doesn't consume. Our continent's development is linked with its ability to sustain progress in food systems. Africa will not attain the sustainable development goals if countries cannot ensure that food systems guarantee food sovereignty. This is a crucial challenge, ladies and gentlemen, and one that must be met as we work together as partners to chart a new course towards the attainment of a shared, of our shared development goals, but of a shared prosperity as well. So thank you very much and looking forward to a lively discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Ahuna. Next um, speaker, uh, also delivering opening remarks, would be um, Ms. Nada Spikala Thomas, um, CEO of the African Union Development Agency. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I have not been sleeping for the last how many days? I don't know. And we're running from one meeting to the other. So um, I have a speech, but maybe, you know, I can just say some words and then, you know, um, and then I'll have to, to dash out with your permission, Aona. Uh, good morning, Aona. Thank you so much for organizing this, um, this gathering, which is very important for us. And good morning to my friend, you know, who, who is the minister of uh, Liberia and uh, the 
this, the envoy, the special envoy of the uh, government of Somalia, all my colleagues, my friends, scientists, thinkers, you know, I think, you know, we are here to just tap on your knowledge, on your experience, so that we can inform our instruments, the policy frameworks that we have, and we have many of them, and, uh, and the strategies that we have put in place at national, regional, and continental levels. I think what is very important for me is to make sure that, you know, the outputs of uh, uh, this discussion be uh, given to us so that we can incorporate, enhance the already existing framework like the comprehensive African agricultural development uh, program, which is there, which is translated in terms of a national program and the national investment plan is, is put in place, in addition to the many instruments that, the, uh, that are there. Um, it would be uh, very important for Africa to understand that uh, you know, when there is something, you just improve on that, you know, and let's not reinvent the wheel. And I keep on saying that by reinventing the, the wheel, we've been remaining at the same equilibrium point. You know, we demolish, we start, we're at that level. We demolish, we start, we're at that level. That's what's happening to, to Africa. So going back, reviewing, drawing lessons and improving on that and building the knowledge is very critical and very important. That is my... Um, appeal to you, please, 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 your outcomes would help us improve at continental level, but regional level, national level, and, uh, and it should be disseminated. This is something <clears throat> very important that would come out of this. You know, we have the brains, you know, that are here from the diaspora and from within Africa. The second thing is let's advocate for a holistic approach at the government level. Food systems, food security would entail the involvement of each and every ministry. <clears throat> Madam Minister, you cannot do it alone. You have to have the entire cabinet with you so that you know each one takes his part and her part and implement it. In Africa, we have to, re we are working in silos, you know. If you come out with one thing, then the other wants to demolish it and to undermine that. So, you know, that culture of working together and making sure that we have an integrated approach is critical and very important. And, you know, the last shocks have shown us that it's critical, it's so important, okay? So I think, you know, that is one thing that we can work together to advocate for a holistic approach and maybe move away from the way we, we organize ourselves in terms of our implementation. The third thing is, while we're talking about our own um, administrative structures, you know, I think the shocks, apart from the climate shocks, apart from the, um, you know, external shocks, like what we see now, there is also our own shock, the disruptor, I think, is our political process. It doesn't allow us to work we would be running from one election to the other, to the other, to the other, no time for people to breathe and no time for people to work. So we have to, uh, you know, I keep on talking this with you, Ahuna. We have to have a discussion on our governance and our political processes. It has not delivered for us and we need to have a process that would deliver for us. And we need that reflection. At one point in time, we can join you, but the APRM is there to join you. <clears throat> the third thing is implementation. In the implementation, I think, you know, we talk too much, but we don't put our resources. <clears throat> the Malabo Declaration obliges, you know, countries to put 10% of its GDP or GNP into agriculture with a, with a few exceptions of three or four most of the countries have not done so. We cannot develop our countries. We cannot have our sovereignty. We cannot have our security by begging. We have to know where to put our resources. And therefore, you know, we would oblige the ministers of finance to make sure that the necessary basic needs of countries are met. At least, you know, the majority and then ask you know, others to match the rest. You know, I think, you know, the last one is innovation technology. We have all what it takes now. We have to take advantage of the innovative minds. We have to take 
advantage of the technology to come out with smart uh, agriculture uh, te um, technologies and smart agriculture production. We cannot do it the way we are doing. We're talking about shocks from, you know, this Ukraine war. You know, my mother was like surprised. She says, wheat, Africa imports wheat. And, and it's just like a surprise to her. I said, yeah, Africa imports wheat. And it's a shock for our parents, grandparents, because they never thought, you know, that Africa would ex import, but export food, you know. And, and this is, you know, this should be the shock, you know, of our society also. It's a shock. But this shock is also has got a positive thing because we seem to be innovative when there are shocks. So hopefully, you know, some good things would come out of this. So we look at, at it from the positive aspect of it, the opportunities it would offer to re-examine the way we do things, to re-examine how we produce, how we consume. You know, most of us are now inclined to consuming what we don't produce. And God has created our ecology to be able to, to, to feed, you know, the people, you know, that, that live in there. It's, it's very interesting because, you know, I was just examining, you know, um, like in, uh, in South Africa, Ayo, we have oranges and, uh, and, and all citric things. When? During the winter, when it's cold. Other times, it's not there. All these seasonal fruits are really meant, you know, to show us that, you know, ecologically, you know, uh, fit production is very important and very critical for us. And we don't have to really look up to, you know, the others and change the way uh, we consume also. And, and the last thing I like what you said is, you know, quality assurance is very critical and very important. Our people are being fed you know, things that are dumped on Africa. I mean, the chicken that is really frozen and for many years would come to Africa. The, the wheat that is almost, you know, what do you call it when uh, these little things come, come to Africa. The rice that is, you know, we shouldn't be a dumping place. We should really keep our dignity and be able to, 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 to produce, to consume, with dignity. And therefore, I think, you know, there are many things that I would be saying. I don't go to the technical things because you people are there, but from the technical thing, the infrastructure, everything should be built. We need to improve on all uh, the loss, the, the post-harvest loss is incredible in, Af in Africa. And this has been going on for years and years. What is, what is impeding us from solving this problem, you know? What is impeding us from really perfecting the market systems? And yes, in Africa, we have now all these frameworks. The AFCFTA is there so that there is a free flow, but there is no infrastructure. Aruna, you know, I was just like going from South Africa to, to Equatorial Guinea three nights and I have to go to, to Europe to go there. I mean, so there's so much to do. But in any case, we cannot be pessimist. We have to be optimist and we count on your brains to come out with solutions, we would perfect our instruments and we'll be lobbying for, for you know, a better uh, management uh, of our resources, you know, uh, be it, you know, our land, you know, all the factor of production, but also, you know, when I say resources is the human capital and the innovative minds and the, uh, and the energies of the people. We have so many people that can transform this continent, you know, and, and we have to really make sure that we harness them. Um, I want to really thank you and would like to say that we are uh, running to launch a program called Energize Africa at 12.30. Um, you are all welcome. It's really to see with all the other actors uh, that are there, the UNDP, uh, my, uh, my former home, you know, <laughs> and the UN system and, and see how we can use the resources that we have, especially the youthful energies and the youthful innovative minds. Thank you very much. I really, truly really appreciate it. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much for those very insightful um, uh, opening remarks and very encouraging as well. Um, delivering our keynote um, remarks, we're very honored to have the CEO of the African Development Foundation in Washington, D.C., Mr. Travis, Travis Atkins. Travis. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you to all. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, and I couldn't have been more excited uh, about the critical nature uh, of the subject uh, for today's uh, session. Uh, at USADF, the notion of shockproofing uh, is really central uh, to everything that we do, and that is because our work is focused on the everyday people of Africa. Uh, and one of the things that I've taken to saying early in my tenure uh, is that regardless of COVID or climate, regardless of conflicts or coups, the everyday people of Africa have to have the capacity to sustain themselves, have to have the capacity to plan for their future, have to have the capacity to meet the aspirations of themselves um, and their children. Uh, and a big part of that, of course, is our focus on African-owned and African-led development. Uh, the majority of our work uh, is in the sphere of agriculture. Uh, it is uh, focused on the marginalized majorities of Africa, uh, which are its women, uh, which are its youth. And so when you look at the state of affairs now in terms of food systems across the continent, uh, my sisters have said it all so well uh, this mix of colonial legacy, this mix of post-independence challenges to governance, uh, this mix of the inability of some nations on the continent uh, to have a monopoly of force, to provide actual physical security uh, for their borders uh, and for their people, and how all of this plays into uh, the suffering uh, of those everyday people uh, that I talk about. Uh, probably one of the more overused uh, African proverbs is the one that says that when the elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers, but it's so apropos uh, in a moment like ours. Uh, obviously, the current pressures on food systems in Africa uh, come from a perfect uh, and terrible storm, uh, which is related to drought, uh, which is related to global financial crises which is related uh, to a global pandemic uh, sweeping across uh, a nation that was, or excuse me, nations uh, in Africa, which were already struggling with some of these challenges. Um, as, as Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres declared recently, we're living in a perfect storm caused by a tangled web of food, energy, and financial crises. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the first time the world has faced the threat of massive hunger and starvation following a spike in food prices. In 2007 and eight, and then again in 2010 and 11, food prices suddenly increased following a three decade hiatus when food prices were stable and low. The current surge in food prices is the highest recorded since 1961, even higher than the surge in the first half of the 1970s due to the infamous 1973 oil crisis. Uh, and one of the charges that I was given this morning was just to talk about uh, what some of those challenges look like um, in the real world. Uh, what are some of the things we can do to remediate those challenges uh, and ways we can work together uh, as a global community to try to shore up uh, these nations, to shore up these people, to ensure that we can actually move people beyond food security into the notion of food self-sufficiency. Why would we be dependent on the continent uh, on other people to feed us? Why would we have our nations on the continent be overtaken because somebody in another region decided they wanted to have a war? And how can we strengthen ourselves against this? Uh, so clearly some of the key challenges, uh, we talk about Africa as one of the fastest urbanizing um, continents or regions uh, of the world, uh, people moving away from agriculture, young people seeing the gnarled hands of their mothers and fathers, the pain in their back, 
uh, the dearth of resources they're getting for all of the work that they're putting um, into agriculture, making it less attractive uh, for future generations. Uh, obviously, as many have said, uh, dependence on external sources for production inputs, particularly fertilizers, uh, substantial post-harvest losses from farm to market, many linked to infrastructure and transport challenges, as well as processing issues. Additionally, of course, uh, we talked about colonial legacies, ongoing land tenure issues uh, across the continent that affect the scale of operations, as well as access to credit for producers. Uh, farmers need to be able to access local markets where others can afford to buy from them. If that market does not exist or farmers lack road infrastructure to get there, as has been the case in many African countries, there's less incentive for productivity uh, to improve. Uh, in terms of remedial actions that we can look towards uh, to try to fight back against uh, this trend, uh, again, continued research and development of high quality seed and planting materials linked to demonstration and distribution systems to make materials available to farmers. Uh, a continued focus on post-harvest systems from farmers throughout the value chains to reduce losses, maintain quality and diversify markets. And this is something else that is central uh, to the work of the US African Development Foundation. Uh, again, the promotion of locally grown and processed alternatives to imported foods is an interesting uh, uh, example of this on a recent visit I had to Cote d'Ivoire and we had funded there a group of local farmers who had faced a crisis of not being able to transport uh, because of COVID and because of transportation and shipping uh, challenges, rice from China. And of course, as Nardos made the point about wheat, the first thing you would ask is why in the world are people in Cote d'Ivoire sourcing their rice all the way from China? And so they began to say, we can grow it ourselves. And as much as that is a positive development, uh, there is a part of you that is sad because they could have been growing their own rice uh, for decades. And one of the challenges they have is that people have grown up on this imported rice. And so the texture of it and the smell of it and the feel of it in your mouth and on your hands and on the spoon uh, is something that people have an attachment to. Uh, and so getting them away from that, uh, having the promotion of locally grown uh, production. Uh, as I close, additionally, the promotion of regional and sub-regional integration of markets to help address local dislocations that may occur due to drought or other factors. Uh, to look at some of the ways in which we can partner uh, with USADF, UNDP, and others to support African nations in this way uh, is the promotion of improved post-harvest practices at the farmer level as well as storage, infrastructure, and support to SMEs engaged in processing and distribution. We wanna help them to uh, it reduce, excuse me, losses uh, and improve and maintain their quality. We wanna increase farmer productivity through training and increased access to improved seeds and technologies, including appropriate mechanization, irrigation, and access to information to name a few. We also want to promote integrated, sustainable production systems and improved access to affordable financing for farmers and processors and off takers. Financing is extremely expensive um, at those levels. Uh, and so these are some of the key points uh, to help us launch our conversation uh, today. My brothers and sisters who will join us after have much greater depth than I do in this field. And I'm looking forward uh, to joining you all uh, and taking notes as we listen to their conversation. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that excellent. Um, thank you so much for that very excellent um, um, contribution. Um, Sir Travis Atkins, I'm CEO of the US African Development Foundation. Now it gives me great pleasure to invite the first panel to join us up front, um, we have the Honorable Janine Milley Cooper, Minister of Agriculture, Republic of Liberia. Also His Excellency Abdurrahman Wasame, Special Presidential Envoy for Drought Response, Federal Republic of Somalia. 
Misatu Santana, Sat, Sat, Satala, Associate Vice President for um, External Relations and Governance and Director of East and Southern Africa Division at IFAD. Um, Dr. Abebe, Abebe Haile Gabriel, Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Africa at the Food and Agricultural Organization will be joining us remotely. And Mr. Jai Shroff, CEO of UPL Limited. And please join us. Uh, thank you so much uh, for um, uh, joining us, um, panel. Um, in the interest of time, we'll get straight to it. Um, Honorable Janine Cooper, um, how have recent global shocks affected Liberia's food security at both community and national levels? And what steps has the government taken to um, redress this? Well, um, uh, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you to Ahuna and uh, uh, the UN for and, and African Union for inviting me here. <clears throat> uh, there was a lot of power on that panel that was here before us and a lot of mentorship, personal mentorship for me. Um, I owe some of the boldness and um, uh, creativity that we apply to solutions to at least the two ladies that uh, were here, Ahuna and Nardos. Thank you for that, Ahuna. Um, the recent global shocks affected Africa's food security uh, in predictable ways. And when you have worked in the system of food insecurity, for as long as I have since 1999, actually, um, and actually even before that, since 1990, when my country went to a civil war, um, you see the same thing happening. No matter what the shock is, the result is the same. The challenges are the same. The problems are the same. Uh, food insecurity, let's bring in the solutions are often quite the same. But this, uh, this time, the shocks were slow onset, something that in Liberia, West Africa, we're not so much used to slow onset as they are in Eastern Africa with the droughts and the food crisis where you have early warning systems say, hey, 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 you're gonna have a problem six months down the line. It took us by surprise. And so immediately we tried to apply the same solutions as before and they have never worked. We just go as a re repetitive cycle. And so <clears throat> one of the things <clears throat> um, that I would like to say in Liberia, uh, we have tried to look into something that used to be a no-no for us when I was in the UN, looking into the root causes, looking at how people live and access food regularly every day. Um, how it's not enough to just say, oh, um, there's food insecurity has increased by such and such percent, which is what we usually do. But what can we, what exactly, how has it increased? For whom? Um, we did a rapid food assessment that was very much less rapid than I wanted. Uh, so since June, I asked for it. We just got the results last week. And what does it show? malnutrition spiking in the urban areas, um, areas that were food insecure, a little bit more food insecure, people tightening their belts in predictable ways. Well, how can we support them so that that doesn't have to happen? Because in Liberia, we're not in a country, we're in a country with a lot of resources, natural capital, food dropping from trees. Uh, it's growing wild. Uh, famine is unknown to us. Hunger is, but famine is, is unknown to us. Um, so <clears throat> we looked at some solutions uh, in that way, but I guess that's the, the next question. So I'll stop there and pass it on. Uh, thank you so much uh, for those uh, remarks. Um, Your Excellency Abdurrahman Wasami. Uh, Minister Cooper talked about repetitive cycles. When you think about repetitive cycles, we usually think about the Horn of Africa as well. And because drought is repetitive. And from that perspective, um, could you tell us um, how 
the, these recent um, global and local shocks have impacted food security in Somalia and what you think um, governments like Somalia should do differently to address this? Uh, thank you very much for, I'm, I'm thankful for, uh, and I thank you for organizing this uh, important event in a critical time. Uh, Somalia has a different case from, from other countries because we are struggling to establish a government. We've been subject for last 30 years instability in our nation. And the political process was very challenging to have a stability in, in the country. So uh, the food insecurity, it is, uh, uh, have impact on Somalia. We are facing very critical drought in, for there is almost four consecutive failure of rainy season and 51 is not that expecting much. Uh, that caused by the climate change. Uh, climate change is one of the key uh, sources of the uh, drought in Somalia, plus the instability and conflict and resource or conflict on the resource also is one of the main uh, sources of instability. And, and I'm echo the, uh, the surprise that says that Africa is imports, it is uh, food from the Outside Somalia, case in example, 80% of our food import from outside of the country. While we are having the fertilized land, uh, Somalia has two rivers, long coast uh, in Africa, uh, resource as a mineral or natural resources are full of it. But to capitalize that potentiality, there is a challenge of insecurity, conflict, terrorism, the drought has prevented us to take that opportunity and, 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 and unleash that potentiality in our nation. So we are now struggling, dealing with the effect of the root cause. So uh, it is quite very challenging. Now, uh, as a special foi for drought response, I'm dealing with how we can uh, get effectively to respond to uh, that drought, which has affected almost 7.7 .7 million of my, my fellow citizens. And 60% of them are children, women, and, and elderly people. How we can respond uh, for life saving, at the same time, addressing the short and long term resilience uh, projects in order to prevent the recurrence of the, of the drought. If you ask me to honor Africa, the cycle of the drought used to be every 10 years. Now it is four years. And unless we address that, it's going to be maybe two, every two years, the cycle of drought will be shorter into every two years. So we need together uh, governments, international partners, UN agencies, international organizations, we really, uh, critically examine why we spent every year billions of dollars for drought response and still drought is recurring. That question is very important to why. Why not Africa are taking it is a potentiality of producing in a food and addressing the resiliency program. Is it the problem from the government side? It is the partner side, it is the donor, it is the implementer. We need to ask that critical question. It is time to ask that critical question, uh, honestly speaking. Uh, we blame our failure for others, or we look into, as one of the keynote speakers said, look into the, our government system. Where is the problem lies? It is a governance system, or at the root cause of the problem, or it is others are exploiting our continent and not allowing us to unleash our potentiality. So we need more critical questions on, on this subject. I thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, okay. Mr. Abdul Rahman. Uh, you mentioned that 7.7 .7 million um, in Somalia affected and the overriding, the over, the, the, um, overriding majority of them 
are women, children, and the elderly. Um, Misatu Santala, um, how could organizations like IFAD be relevant to countries like Somalia and Liberia? Well, thank you for that question and, and thank you for, for including IFAD in my question. No? No, it's fine. Yes, great. Well, thank you for the question and, and thank you for including Ifad and myself on this uh, panel and this event today. Extremely timely and I'm humbled by the, the wealth of, of knowledge and experience that we've already heard and are hearing here today. Um, I just wanted to underline what others have said. This is a real wake up call um, for Africa, for the world, um, the current crisis. Uh, of course, the, the underlying reasons are not new, and many of us have been working on this for quite some time, but there is a there is momentum now to actually look at solving them uh, for the longer term, and I much appreciate that attention. Um, and I very much also ap appreciate what we've heard today from uh, the a big part of the solution being taking a food systems approach. So not looking at uh, bits and pieces, but really looking at how does all of this come together? And what I would like to say, both for the, the countries that you have mentioned, but overall for Africa, um, what is critical is in this food systems approach to take the small scale producers, the, the, the rural MSMEs at the heart of our approach and, and kind of look at it from that angle. Because if we want to, uh, as we say today, shock proof, if we want to focus on resilience, it really has to be about uh, the resilience of these producers, these, these small companies, because they are really responsible for uh, a huge part of uh, food production in Africa. I hear about 70% in many countries. Um, and then the, the small companies bring the, the um, the energy and the ability for, for bringing that food to the markets and, and so on. Um, so, um, so that's where, you know, working with these people, their organizations, their communities um, is what really is at the heart of, of what we at IFAD think is sustainable solutions for this. Mm, um, we've heard others and, and Travis, for example, listed many of the areas uh, of work that actually IFAD is doing. We were born out of the food crisis response in the 70s and have over 40 years of experience in precisely this kind of work. Um, and also we, um, we do rigorous um, results measurement and uh, impact assessments. And so we've learned a lot about what works, what doesn't. Um, and I think there's a lot of, uh, of knowledge that we're very happy to share with others too, um, because really we need to kind of, uh, yes, we need to innovate, but we also need to scale up what already uh, we know is working. Um, maybe just, yeah, uh, just the, the, the point that I wanted to make on, you know, what can IFAD bring? Um, and I wanted to underline um, what already was, was mentioned that this is, because this is such a huge challenge, it's a very interlinked challenge. No government ministry, no international organization can do this alone or is sufficient, but we really need to look at collaboration and, and working together on, on bringing the different elements together. So IFAD is a, a UN organization or a UN specialized agency, but also an, an IFI. So we bring the financial solutions to the table, working with governments um, and uh, working very closely with the local communities and, and uh, farmer organizations, women and youth and so on. Um, and, um, and what we want to do is to, you know, assemble development finance. Um, One dollar invested through IFAD brings eight dollars to the table. So bringing different partners together, putting together packages that work um, for, for the local communities. And we're ready to, ready to scale up uh, and very much ready to collaborate with others. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that perspective from IFAD. And, uh, particularly hot in to hear about the financial solutions. We'll probably have time for a quick um, rejoinder, 
But uh, let me go on to um, Dr. Abebe Haile Geb Gabriel, who is joining us remotely. Um, he is Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Africa for the Food and Agricultural Organization. Welcome. Um, in a nutshell, um, we know that WFP has been, FAO has been doing quite a lot of work on food systems um, for a while. What do you think FAO should do differently um, given the evolving nature of both um, domestic and um, global shocks that Africa is facing as far as both food security and food sovereignty are concerned? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> greetings to you all from uh, uh, Accra, Ghana, uh, where the FAO Regional Office is uh, located. It's a pleasure to join this panel. I know I'm speaking after um, a very powerful panelists have already spoken. So uh, I may not be able to uh, bring in a substantial new uh, into the discussion, but let me say this. As you rightly said, uh, FAO has been accompanying uh, member countries uh, in terms of uh, really supporting the efforts to find solutions, lasting solutions to uh, uh, problems of, I would say, structural problems in agri-food uh, system transformation. In the African case, uh, the issue is really a lack of productive capacity. Uh, the uh, CEO of uh, our African Union Development Agency has actually alluded to this, unless we, and also Haruna, uh, Huna, unless we address the issue of productive capacity in Africa, we're not going to go uh, you know, far. Uh, current levels of productivity in Africa are not only low uh, in absolute terms, if you compare it with the uh, developing country average, and this is about cereals, uh, it's about a third, it's about you know, a little more than 30% of what other uh, developing countries average could achieve which means on the one hand, uh, it is too low, but on the other hand, it shows a lot of uh, opportunities for increasing productivity. So FAO focuses on better production, increasing productivity and production of uh, uh, food uh, in Africa. Secondly, it's not just about production. Uh, we have already talked about reduction of post-harvest losses, which varies from 15 to 40%, depending on the kind of uh, products and, and country, uh, but about value addition, about transformation of the agricultural products, about development of agri businesses and agro industries. We believe that this is an area not only uh, of transforming agriculture, but also uh, creating uh, opportunities uh, for employment of the youth women, just, not just any employment, beneficial employment, which will again uh, becomes the basis for Africa to trade uh, within the region in the framework of the Africa continental free trade area, but also to be competitive even locally with imported uh, food products, which uh, uh, Nardos was talking about. So it is really about making agriculture a business, a profitable business, an attractive business. This is what FAO uh, supports. But agriculture is also about what we eat, the food. At the moment, uh, healthy diets have become unaffordable for more than 900 million people in Africa. And this is in Africa where healthy diets can be produced you know, uh, relatively easily. Uh, we should have demystified this. Uh, in the first place. So FAO works also for better nutrition and agriculture is done in an environment. You know, it is about fish, about forestry, about fisheries and so on. So the interaction with nature is very direct. And as we increase production and productivity, we should also aim at attaining sustainable environment. So better environment is also uh, an aspiration that we want to achieve. And of course, it's about livelihood. In Africa, most of uh, my, my, my brother from Somalia who spoke about the situation that uh, is faced in Somalia, but also in the Horn of Africa region, in the Sahel, 
uh, people are losing, what do they lose? Their important asset, which is livestock. You know, building this asset takes a lot of time. And it is about their livelihood and about betterment of the li life of the people leaving no one behind. So it's just not about FAO. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, talking about the whole partnership to support our member states should focus on better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haile Gabriel. Uh, you've you've emphasized the importance of a food systems approach, which goes beyond just how much um, food we have available to the entire system of production, et cetera. Um, you also mentioned uh, making agriculture a business. Uh, we do have a panelist who has made agriculture his business. Uh, Mr. Jai Shroff is CEO of UPL Limited. Um, what are your views on how the private sector could work with African government and multilateral um, organizations to bolster a resilience in Africa's food systems? Thank you. Uh, and a real honor to, to be here and representing the private sector, um, you know, among um, all the uh, UN and other agencies. Now, UPL is uh, is the fifth largest crop protection company. We are one of the largest seed companies in the world, um, and we operate in 136 countries around the world. And uh, you know, but our origins are from India, so we understand the challenges being faced by smallholder farmers and what it takes because. Our business is not with the governments. Our business is not with uh, uh, the UN or or any of the other uh, large organizations. Our, uh, our business is with individual farmers, and and we uh, uh, understand what it takes for a farmer uh, to to do business. Every farmer, and 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 sometimes I I I get nervous because at all these meetings, everybody talks about food systems, but it's not about food systems. It's about business and his profitability of an individual farmer. If you can't st solve the problem of that two acre farmer in Nigeria or Ivory Coast or uh, Rwanda, you're not going to have a food system solution because you cannot subsidize hundreds of millions of farmers for n number of years. So you have to look at an individual farmer and make him resilient. Resilient means my input cost, my cost of production, and I sell the product at a reasonable price like any other industry. If I can't do business in, in Africa, I will shut my business down. If I can't do business in Brazil, I will shut my... Same thing happens with a farmer. If he can't make two ends meet, he was going to be a substance farmer. So he'll produce enough for his family. That's it. Why should I waste time when every five years I'm going to have a drought? Every five years, at least once I'll have a drought, once I'll have a flood, once I will have nobody to buy my produce. And when every when it's a good year, everybody's producing lots, so there's no price. So again, he loses money. So he, he's in a in a in a trap. There's no point of him investing in technology, no point talking about a food system solution when he can't make his meat, men's meat. That's great for the presidential level to talk about, for, for the ministers to talk about. But if he makes money, I promise you, if a farmer makes $100 end of the year in his bank account, he wants to make $1,000 next year. He wants a better education for his family. He will invest. The minute you do that and he has $100, I can tell you there'll be a thousand banks willing to lend him $200 so he can build that. So how do you, how do we look at it as a private sector? We look at individual value chains. We look at individual farmers and what can you do to make him more resilient? And in India, which is such a big uh, example actually for Africa is we have 1.3, 1.4 billion people, 5 billion me meals a day. And it, everybody's eating, okay, some people less and more, it's working, why? Because there is, it was such a big crisis 30, 40 years ago, and now the system works, where every farmer knows that in the end, the government will pay for the rice and take it. So he knows there is an offtake. He knows that there is a prime MSP, what they call as a minimum price, support price. 
And the other thing I just want to, to emphasize is every country can't grow wheat, every country can't grow cocoa, every country can't grow potatoes, but we have to focus on value chains based on competitiveness. Brazil can grow soybean, they cannot grow rice, they import rice, right? Africa should be producing more rice. And, and at UPLV, we are looking at huge systemic uh, projects really on our own because uh, for a private sector to work with multilateral agencies just takes too long. And uh, we have taken some commitments uh, for increasing productivity in rice in the, in the ECOWAS region, uh, 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 productivity on cocoa, uh, productivity in sunflower in Tanzania, uh, uh, sorghum uh, growing in Botswana and, and, and Zambia, and so many little projects which we, we try to focus on what is the right crop? What, how do we improve resilience of farmers? And it is about individual farmers and individual value chain. If I try to grow soya bean in, in Ivory Coast, it's not gonna work. The amount of investment required to compete with Brazil is impossible. Those guys are billion dollar industries. So we really have to look, why can't we make cocoa more profitable for Ivory Coast and, and West Africa? Why can't we make sunflower in Tanzania more profitable? Why can't we look at different value chains and really focus on that and start from the individual farmer? So otherwise it's not gonna work. They cannot adopt to technology. They cannot mechanize. They cannot, people will not invest in value chains because if I know this farmer is not gonna invest in productivity, I will have to eventually pay him more for his grains, for his more produce. I cannot compete as an industry. You have to be competitive, otherwise you die. Thanks. So I think every farmer needs, it has to be at individual farmer level, individual value chain by the market and by the geography. Thank, thank you. So you. thank you so much. Uh, you're bringing resilience down to the farm gate level, I think, uh, and also looking at the profitability issues. Uh, we are running out of time. So I'm going to pose the chat, the panel, and we've got a few really good questions um, online. Um, I'm going to pose a 60 second channel challenge to the panel. Um, one of the things that um, our boss, um, Ahuna Iziakono, always challenges us with is, what could we do differently? Because we've been, we've, we've been, we've been having these repetitive cycles. So for each of you, one disruptive, suggestion, proposal, recommendation that you think could make a difference over the next five years in Africa's uh, food security question. Let me start with you, um, Honorables. Thank you. I'm not surprised that Amuna is still challenging people to be disruptive. Um, that's how I've known her uh, all the last couple of decades. Um, <clears throat> Let me give you one. In Liberia, as in most of Africa, 70 to 80% of the food is produced by women. Everything from seed to plate, farm to plate, farm to fork, whatever is seed to plate to waste is women. Land preparation is men and youth. So what we're doing, and here we, we're, we're working with uh, UN Women and IFAD uh, so far, also WFP and a couple of others is, and this is just one of the disruptive things that we're doing. We looked at how women produce food. And I have here, but I can challenge you to, please, I'll go a little bit more than 60 seconds, so forgive me. Uh, I will challenge uh, each of you to, Google women in agriculture in Africa and look at the images. This is the image. This is where we stay traditionally when we say we're supporting women in agriculture. We're supporting women to plant with a handheld hoe, to backbreaking labor. There's not a single one that is showing anything advanced in agriculture. But women not only plant, they not only weed and harvest and process and store and dry, they also cook and they manage the food waste. What we're doing is that we're looking at all of the value chain where women are and looking at how we can reduce the labor burden. Because if you give one woman 
high yielding seeds. That means there's more labor involved for her to plant it, to harvest it, to weed it, to take care of it, to store it, to process it, etc. And she's still only one person. She still has all her other chores to, to take care of. So if we can look at how we can lessen all of her other burdens in the value chain of food production, consumption, preparation, and waste management, we can help the women. So we're setting up a center of excellence for women in agriculture in Liberia. I Googled it. I can't find a single one around the world. There are centers of excellence for everything else, and, uh, but not for women in agriculture. And I threw, sorry, Ifad, I threw a ministerial tantrum a few weeks ago, and Ifad agreed to fund it. So uh, <laughs> that's one of the disruptors. But we also look at youth employment and the fact that it's young people who are attracted to the machinery. We want to mechanize. Don't train old men how to mechanize. Young people want to mechanize. Look at how we can train them to things that attract them that are not backbreaking labor that give a different image for um, agricultural production. And I'm very, very certain that our story will be different next year. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, excellent. Uh, sir. Somalia, 60 seconds, please, if you can. Um, yeah, it's on. Um, six seconds is very small, well, I'll try to shop. And I think we need really as a government, uh, particularly in Africa and none of Africa, we have to be honest about strengthening our transparency, governance system and inclusivity and also uh, good governance. That's the role of the government in terms of UN or other investors, they need to take some risk for investing in, in Africa and break the cycle of bureaucracy or, or, or that kind of calculating the, their investment. Uh, we need them to take some risk and to be more flexible and, and also trying to break the cycle of, of bureaucracy. What I'm saying that we, in Africa and particularly in my country, a lot of the farmers, they lose their, their production uh, because of lack of infrastructures. There is almost the infrastructure is an issue. Technology is an issue. Uh, modern technology to use the production is very important for us. Infrastructure is very important, as well as getting more investment. That's why I'm mobilizing our diaspora community here in US and, and in Europe. Uh, Somalia has a, have a large, largest diaspora in Africa uh, uh, to invest the food security issue because we have that opportunity and we also prepare ourselves to take the, that opportunity of shock, global shock of food insecurity. It could be opportunity for Africa, particularly for Somalia. So what I'm saying is that we all need, everybody has to break the cycle and to be honest what they are doing, whether it's UN, whether they're investors, whether it's the government level and in Horn, in Horn Africa now, there's a government also who are denying that there's a drought in their countries. And they want to hide that because of political reason. So unless we become honesty, I don't think so we can solve the problem. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, sir. Um, Ms. Antella, there's a price for the person who meets the 60 second challenge. Oh gosh, I feel <laughs> the pressure. Well, first of all, let me bounce off or I, uh, off the Honorable Minister's um, point about women and youth. Um, and I think that is super important and very happy to work on that disruption. But building on that, um, what we're trying to solve uh, together with partners at IFAD is the issue of uh, access to finance for small and medium uh, enterprises, rural enterprises uh, in the agricultural or, or other rural spaces. 
uh, this is an, an underserved market. Their cost of finance is tremendous and, and dif very difficult to access, especially for young uh, starting entrepreneurs who it, it's virtually impossible. And we're working on different methodologies and, and programs to, to get to that. Um, so we think that there's a lot of power in this. Those uh, enterprises will bring you know, technological solutions, services to farmers, uh, and then work along the value chains to make sure that the increased production then does actually reach uh, the consumers um, and makes a real impact on food security. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Um, Haile Gabriel, 60 seconds. Okay, uh, thank you so much, I'll try. Uh, number one, we, we need to fix the incentive structure. And this is not just on the base of theory, but on the, on the base of practice. There are successful cases and experiences. Africa can learn from that, fix the incentive structure. Second, repurpose resources. Resources are limited. For example, we want to incentivize sustainable production, uh, supply and consumption of nutritious food, right? Then let's prioritize food consumers. I think this is a challenge. This way we can help make healthy diets less costly and more affordable for all. Third, we need to embrace science and innovation because there is no other way. I don't have to elaborate this. Fourth, let's seek and enforce mutual commitment and accountability to actions and to results. We know that international support has been seasonal. It has been following cycles of crisis. Let it be more strategic, and more predictable. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, excellent uh, summary there. Um, Mr. Jai Shroff. Yes. Uh, 60 seconds. I think uh, we heard this morning that $78 billion of food gets imported to Africa. I would, uh, I would uh, say that you, you, you should have at least 10% of that, 7 billion a year invested in, in uh, you know, making sure the food systems are working, the farmers are, are, are supported. Uh, it's, it's easy, that's how a business would look at it. Import substitution, great uh, opportunity, great business opportunity for country foreign exchange, and then allocate that by core competencies in, uh, in different value chains. Thank you. Thank you so much. Join me in thanking an excellent panel. And I would actually invite the next panel to join us now. This panel will be um, moderated remotely and by my colleague, Mr. Andrew Bovarnik, who is global head of UNDP's Food and Agricultural Commodity Systems. On the next panel, we have um, Dr. Hiba Ahmed from Islamic um, Solidarity Fund for Development. We have Ms. Athana Alio for Senegal country resident representative for the Global Green Growth Initiative Institute, Dr. Lucius Odu, who is a director of the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC, and Dr. Arif Hussein, who is chief economist uh, for the World Food Program. And we'll also have um, my colleague and uh, our resident representative and head of the finance hub in Pretoria, South Africa, um, Dr. Ayo Odusola joined this. Um, I'm not sure if we have um, Andrew online um, to take over, but um, while Andrew comes in, let me ask, uh, invite um, Dr. Odusola to give us five minutes, no more, of um, opening remarks, of uh, scene setting remarks. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Remat. And uh, Thank you, the Director for Africa, uh, UNDP, and the Assistant Secretary General for UNDP, Ahuna, uh, who is my boss. And uh, our distinguished panelists, mine is just to probably wear the appetite. I think we already did it this morning. I, I don't think this one is necessary anymore. But essentially, the idea is for us, we've listened to the opening as well as the marvelous uh, panel we've just had. What is really intriguing about
Africa. And uh, it is. OK. Now we've talked about dealing with the capacity issue, which has been one of the areas that has been fully, fully emphasized by the various speakers. But I just want to look at uh, the issue of food uh, system. Uh, food security is about having sufficient uh, access to safe and nutritious food in the system. Now, there are about three components we have to look at. The issue is availability. That's number one. The second one is access. And the third one is utilization. But I think we've been talking about availability. We've not been able to talk about the two components of the full system. Availability is about productive capacity, which you know, it's really very low. But how do we really ensure that even when those, the food, uh, food items are available, are they accessible? Are they affordable? I think this is one of the issues we've got to talk about. And this is one of the reasons why we have almost all African countries have national green reserves. But the management of it has been a major challenge. That's one in that area in terms of the issue of access. The third element is what we call the issue of utilization. Colleagues, now there has been many African countries where the food may be available, but it's not utilized. If you look at most of the pastoralists from Mauritania up till Eritrea, even up to the Eastern part of Africa, there's one thing there that there are a lot of taboos. There are a lot of practices that are not making people to have access to nutritious food. It is in most pastoralist communities for you to sell your cow in period of distress to buy food for the people. They see it as a sign of weakness. Even when people are dying, you don't want to sell it even if you have 2000 heads of cow. So these are the kind of thing in terms of access. So it's really very important. We need to really deal with this issue. It's really very vital. So in this regard, now, if you look at the asset, the, Af I mean, the, the continent has, Africa has no business in, with food insecurity. Apart from having what we call uh, the issue of 60% uh, of the world uncultivated arable land that is now hosted by the continent, though about 50% of this, in, they are inaccessible because of wars and conflict. Two, if you talk about the water body system we have in Africa, the longest river in the world, River, river Nile, and also the deepest river, the second deepest river in the world, River Congo, and also the longest, what they call uh, um, the uh, I mean, uh, freshwater lake in the world, Lake Tanganyika. Now, we have all this but less than 6% of arable land is irrigated in Africa. So how can we really, really uh, shock prove the production capacity? It's not possible. We need to really reverse it and do it along that way. So in this regard, I strongly believe there are a number of things we need to do behaviorally. Ahuna has mentioned that Africa produces what it doesn't consume and consume what it doesn't produce. We need to change that behavioral thing. It's a psychological issue. You need to do that. Two, in Africa, we produce to meet our taste, not to meet the market taste. So that's one behavioral issue again that we need to really address. Also, we see agriculture as a way of life, not as a business enterprise. It cannot continue that way. And my dear brother mentioned earlier on, on the need for us to really make sure agriculture is market driven and it's a business enterprise. That's what is going to be the stimulant to really produce more. And also the issue that we talk about in terms of uh, one, dealing with the issue of uh, accelerated transformation of agricultural policies. We've mentioned a lot of it. I wouldn't want to mention more, but I just want to remind us of CADEP, the Maputo Declaration. It says 10% of agricultural, I mean, of national budget must be dedicated to agriculture. Only five countries have been able to do it consistently since we started. They said, we should try to ensure we achieve at least 6% growth in agriculture. Not many countries have been able to do this. And they said there must be 1% allocation to research and development in agriculture. 
We've not been able to, not a single country has been able to meet that. So these are things which I think we need to do in a more different uh, manner. And the third element which I just want to say is that one, because we rely heavily on what they call last scale monocultural plants, everybody's talking about corn, everybody's talking about wheat, everybody's talking about uh, rice, but there are indigenous products that are more nutritious than all of them put together. We have allowed this cash crop, uh, uh, what they call uh, problem, to move us away from indigenous. There is no country in Africa that does not have at least three to five indigenous plants that are more nutritious than all these cash crops, but we've thrown them away by virtue of modernization. So I think we need to go back there because that's where the nutrition really realize. So that's really very important. I know I'm under really constraint. I, I want to also mention that we cannot be able to, we will not be able to foolproof or shock proof uh, agriculture without dealing with conflict and fragility. Many African countries, you go there, look at the problem between pastoralists and farmers, especially in West Africa and Central African countries. People want to, they cannot even go to the farm because they are because they may be attacked. So this is part of the thing we need to address. Two, we need to really stop exporting primary commodities. Now, the more primary commodities you, you export, the less job you create because of the value chain element you've not explored at home. Two, we need to add value. We have local content policies in many African countries, but we don't implement them. Thanks to Ghana that have started adding value to cocoa. Now Ghana is exporting chocolate, in fact, to many countries. I think that's really it, but we need to really see how we can finalize it. Finally, uh, I think we need to really, really also look at this value, the value chain component, because we realize that uh, the potential for agricultural value chain, backward and forward integration, has about 3.7 trillion potential by 2030, more than the current GDP of the entire continent. How can we exploit it? Today, it's far, far, in fact, we are not even exploring up to 20% of it. So this is very important. Can we also, through our partnership with the international community, see how we can stop what we usually call uh, the policy ambivalence, especially export distorting policy that do not allow African agricultural commodities to access most of these advanced countries. We need to really do, deal with that. Uh, for instance, the issue of uh, tariff escalation, because when you add one value to it, they will just add the tariff to about 10, 15, 20%. So we need to really deal with that. But I strongly believe this is the way to go. In terms of disrupting policies, I just have one or two things to mention. One, let us start agricultural corridor. Many countries have started it where we are at a particular place, we put about 200 to 500 to 1,000 farmers to be there, where equipment will be there, where market will be there, the bank will be there, everything. This is what they call agricultural settlement in the 60s. But this is the corridor that will help us to really maximize these productive economies of scale for small scale farmers productivity enhancement. I think this is really good. We need to really, really make sure that in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, we need to really institute what you call the risking policy in the agricultural sector, especially weather insurance system for small scale farmers that is affordable, that will protect them when this recycled uh, uh, natural disaster really happens. So colleagues, this is just to say, uh, I'm just setting the ground, but I am now passing the button to the other uh, extinguished panelists to take it from there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, so thank you all. This is Andrew Bovanek. Uh, I am the head of UNDP's global practice on food and agriculture, uh, commodity systems. And it's just a pleasure to be here in this event remotely. And uh, thank you colleague, Dr. Ayodele for that, uh, those scene setting remarks. Um, just before I, I kick off this panel, I'm aware we are quite delayed, so we'll try to, to catch up on some time. But to say as well that you know all the speeches and, and discussions that we've heard so far really reaffirms to me that collectively, 
you all, we all have so much of the knowledge about what is needed to happen in terms of the variety of interventions and solutions. But I think it was our honorable colleague from Somalia who, who asked to me the most critical question, why isn't change happening? Or why isn't it happening sufficiently quickly and at scale to be really disruptive? And as we know from the, the, the title of this event, shocks are happening more and more quickly and more and more severely. And so collectively as a global community, we have to get better at accelerating and catalyzing real, real change so that these types of solutions you're all championing can really be adopted. And so I, I'm hopeful that this panel will, will take all the fantastic uh, ideas and suggestions so far in this event and go deeper into really considering and, and framing, you know, how can we really uh, implement to scale and accelerate change on the ground. So, so with that, let me please call the first uh, panelist, uh, who I believe is also remote, and that is Dr. Uh, Hiba Ahmed, the Director General of the Islamic Solidarity uh, Fund for Development. Uh, Hiba, please, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will uh, make it uh, very quick because it is already 6 p.m. Uh, Jeddah time. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, technology and uh, what role can it play in accelerating food security across Africa. Uh, so uh, the role of technology, of course, uh, throughout uh, time is well documented in history in improving agricultural productivity. Uh, evidence shows that uh, it is a critical element of uh, agricultural development in both uh, North and South. Uh, the Green Revolution of the 60s in Asia, for example, uh, could not have happened without agricultural research and technology. Uh, and the existence of improved uh, seed varieties and fertilizers, for example, propelled uh, the Green Revolution. But unfortunately, after more than 60 years, uh, Africa still lags other regions in agricultural technology. Uh, and investing in technology is sometimes considered uh, as a luxury that most farmers cannot really attain. Uh, it is not a priority in most uh, government uh, policies. Uh, and although there are so many factors to, to explain uh, low agricultural productivity, we find that underinvestment in science and technology, including agricultural research, uh, is well documented. Uh, for example, the African Agricultural Status Report uh, 2022, uh, published by AGRA, uh, showed that there is a down, uh, uh, indicates that uh, there is uh, uh, spending on agricultural research is falling, uh, you know, over time uh, in, in real terms. Then what there, uh, how, so where do we go from here? Uh, I think uh, that uh, Africa, of course, uh, needless to say, will need to invest more sustainably in agricultural research and technology and do in, but most importantly, it needs to be done in ways that benefit smallholder production systems. 80% uh, of African farmers are smallholders, uh, two hectares and less, 40%, uh, uh, they represent 40% of the cultivated uh, area. Hence, uh, we need to really uh, work on empowering smallholder farmers to achieve a sustainable uh, food security and agricultural transformation. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, there are uh, seven uh, types of technologies that have been uh, looked over uh, throughout Africa, uh, but uh, more or less uh, countries differ from uh, one country to the next. Uh, the first uh, one uh, is enhanced uh, crop and livestock yields, uh, for example, uh, technologies that improve seed varieties, uh, uh, that provide appropriate uh, fertilizers, uh, technologies that improve uh, nutrition, uh, just as uh, bio uh, fortification of stables like maize, rice, and cassava. These have been tried. Uh, technologies that improve labor and labor productivity, uh, such as farm mechanization and efficient irrigation technologies. 
a uh, third type of the group is accelerating uh, climate adaptation uh, by uh, deploying early maturing and drought resistance crops, for example. Uh, also, the technologies that improve market access, uh, digital technologies, ICTs, innovations uh, that link smallholder farmers to both input and output markets. Uh, Access to affordable and reliable energy is very important area. Uh, for example, in Sudan, uh, pivot, uh, pivot, uh, most pivot irrigation uh, relies on solar systems. Hence, uh, uh, we need to uh, provide you know, a kind of a reliable energy to accelerate commercialization and also promote processing and value addition uh, at large scale. Uh, technologies of industrialization are very important uh, because they increase value added and allow, uh, allow small farmers, you know, uh, to kind of uh, increase their income. And finally, uh, uh, this type of most uh, probably most technologies are all about supply augmentation. Uh, of food uh, products. However, uh, there are a lot of technologies that are available uh, to manage food waste and also a uh, kind of work on the demand side of things. Uh, in general, uh, unfortunately, uh, I would like to also kind of refer to a comment that was provided in the, in the opening remarks uh, regarding uh, food system sovereignty issues and also the dependence of Africa on in the, in international markets. I think the issue of technology is the most uh, area where this is very clear, where all African, most African countries, if not all, are importers of technology. Uh, I end by saying that, uh, you know, uh, in ISFD and IDP, actually, inter, uh, uh, we have a, a huge program uh, for the Islamic, in the Islamic Development Bank uh, that we just announced in July 2022. It's called the Food Security Response Program, uh, which is uh, a total of uh, US dollars, uh, 10 billion point five uh, dollars, uh, which uh, we have 27 uh, member countries in Africa. Uh, and the project uh, works on two different levels. Uh, the level, uh, the first level is that to address immediate food security uh, requirements. Uh, plus in the long term uh, address, you know, sustainable production systems that are shock proof. Uh, I can go uh, in more details if time permits, but uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Hiba, and thank you for that uh, good news about all of that additional uh, funding available. I'm sure many in the audience and the panel will look forward to hearing more about that. Um, but let me now just hand over uh, to our next panelist, Ms. Asana Alio, who is the country resident representative of Senegal for the Global Green Growth Institute. So please, Ms. Asana. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm representing the Global Green Growth Institute, and we focus mainly on green growth strategies and also which aligns with food security in the climate sector. We're focusing on how climate change impacts various sectors, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's agriculture, whether it's through policy, because we are an intergovernmental organization and we have a host country agreement with the government. In doing so, we implement projects on the ground. And as a country representative, for me to be able to implement these projects and to mobilize resources for climate finance, I actually have the opportunity to go to the ground interact with the farmers that are impacted to enable food security. So for me, this is something I'm passionate about. I, I love the work that I do and I can see the change. So it was such a pleasure to hear the panelists to share their different perspectives on how we can make this the shock proof. Uh, from my experience for GGGI, we've been looking at climate resilient solutions because climate change is a real fact that has disrupted and impacted a lot of farmers. Uh, statistics wise in Senegal, I will give you a one family member, a single farmer feeds up to 10 family members, right? Between eight to 10, the minimal. So when you're looking at that as a smallholder farmer in, a, I would say in one village, you can have up to 200 smallholder farmers. When climate change occurs, the date of the planting changes in terms of when they can plant. 
what kind of quality seeds and fertilizers they gain access to completely changes. It disrupts the market because the same seeds and fertilizers that we're using prior is no longer valuable. Even if the plant is going to impact the harvest, which then impacts their revenue, which impacts their capacity to feed their family and at the long term have additional revenue for additional resources such as education or healthcare. That's just one component, right? So when we're looking at smallholder farmers, there's three things we've identified as a potential challenge. Access to good quality seeds and fertilizers is key. And also training and changing behavioral change and mindsets and gaining access to additional fertilizers such as organic fertilizers. Smallholder farmers are used to spending less money to gain greater resources, which is key. Everyone wants to because you have less access to resources. Do smallholders farmers have access to buying the seed and fertilizers? The truth is yes. If we provide them with the right tools, will they be able to afford it little by little? They can if we help them increase their yield by gaining access to the right crops, seeds, fertilizers. But most importantly, especially for women, most women, what they ask me for when we go to the field, we need access to training. The moment you train one woman in any village, they will train their entire household. They will transfer that knowledge to their family. They will transfer that knowledge to their children. And the moment they increase their yield and revenue, they invest it in their children's education and they put it back into diversifying their crops. So then they're able to increase. So that is very important that we focus on investing in women. So smallholder farmers and also access to land is a big issue for a lot of women. So at the small scale, I would say it's gaining access to resources to, and also quality seeds and fertilizers and changing the mindset to adopt organic fertilizer because they have the raw materials to produce their own organic fertilizers, which also is good because it impacts the environment and we're not using chemicals, which aligns with climate change and our objectives and also is good for the soil. Constantly using chemicals in the same soil, it depletes the soil. So whenever they continue to plant, they don't get the same results. So that's one at the smallholder farmer level. We have to look at the middle sector, which is small enterprises and the youth that are investing, SMEs that would like to grow their crops. And these are educated young entrepreneurs who have the capacity to do other jobs, but they love agriculture. They want to grow and they want to scale. They need access to finance. And also incubator systems that are there, whether it's through the private sector or the government, to give them the support system they need tax incentives, accommodations, and also giving them priority in gaining access to creating additional jobs in this economy. So that other smallholder farmers that are saying that we have to resort to farming can even go and work for these organizations as well. So we're looking at the creation of additional green jobs if we give access to SMEs. At the national level, we're looking at also policy implementation. If we don't hold governments accountable for example, as uh, it was mentioned earlier for the Maputo, 10% when we're looking at, for example, ECOWAS, ECOWAS doesn't hold the countries accountable because which countries are coming back and saying that you've actually implemented your 10% budget, which must be allocated towards agriculture. No one does the reporting at the end and no one, there are no negative impacts if you don't meet that 10%. So it's no longer a priority. And at the national level, we're looking at union farmers so currently we're working on a project uh, for GGGI as a whole, we've invested up to 1 billion in climate finance. Whenever we see there's a disruption, we will go immediately into the different sectors. We're working with union farmers at the national level to produce rice. Senegal imports rice and as mentioned before, it's about the taste of the quality of the rice. People are used to a certain type. Rice is often imported from either Thailand or China or other countries, whereas Senegal has the irrigated land that can enable it to be produced in country. So today we're working about 200 union farmers and the goal is to produce rice. So I'm gonna take that one as an example as one of the crops we're working with. It's about 10,000 hectares. And on those 10,000 hectares, one of the biggest challenges we've seen is that we need irrigation. We're closer to the Sahel, the climate change is disrupting. We need, and a climate smart agriculture for us is not just the technology, but also the practices of climate smart agriculture. Those are two components. So we're working on those components and we're working with the union farmers and the union farmers, they raised this, we don't have access to finance. Immediately, we brought in the Agricultural Bank of Senegal to come in with the financing and produce the financing mechanism to enable them to gain access to that. Once we've enabled the irrigation to be powered by solar panels, 
the cost is cheaper. Why? Because prior they were using fuel to power their stations. And this fuel takes the risk, additional costs. And as you know, the moment fuel prices go up, agriculture, the capacity to produce is immediately goes down. They were spending more than 50% of their revenue paying for fuel. So the moment we change this, it changes everything. So that's what, those are the three components I wanted to talk about, but most importantly, it's about accountability. But I think we need to look at a, a PPP structure where we need to think about climate change disrupts everything, the entire value chain. And there are those three sectors we need to look at from national to the medium and also to the smallholder farmer and find tailored solutions to each. But there's one thing that is equivalent to all three is that climate change affects all three sectors. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. And thank you for such an integrated holistic uh, package you presented. Um, in the interest of time, let me quickly move on to our, our penultimate speaker, Dr. Alo Aloysius Ordu, the director of the Africa Growth Initiative for uh, the Brookings Institute. So please, Dr. Ordu, over to you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Raymond. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and it's good to reconnect with many colleagues here. Look, we have heard so many things this, mo this morning. If we can just implement what we heard, we will not be where we are right now. Satu and I first met way back in the African Development Bank when I was vice president at the African Development Bank. And in 2009, we were debating these same issues. We are, the world was facing triple Fs, food, fuel, and financial crisis. Look back now, that was a long, it seems like a long time ago, because then you had a rallying call. You had the G20, you had the G8, not seven then. <laughs> you know, you, you had them basically asking the MDBs to act counter cyclically and we were able to avert a crisis, a crisis of the order of magnitude we had never seen before. So we thought. Fast forward to 2022, it's quintuple, you, you, you name it, you, there are so many Fs now. In addition to food, fuel, financial crisis, debt, we also have fragility, which is ravaging across the continent, and we have the climate change crisis not to mention the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So these are all challenges that we're confronted with. If you take the fragility element, because it's very difficult for us to shockproof agriculture in an, it, it, a setting that's very unconducive to agriculture. Here, you're talking of the entire Sahel region. Yet my own country, Northern Nigeria, and other parts of the country, central, many countries in Central Africa, the Horn of Africa, we heard the Honorable uh, uh, Minister, you know, advisors talk about that in, in the case of Somalia. So we have Northern Mozambique areas, we have Madagascar. So no matter how you look at it, the ravages of climate and fragility are wreaking havoc on food systems and agricultural production in Africa. It's not a lack of technology. We heard the, um, the, the gentleman from India talk about where we all, I mean, the invention of the so-called green revolution. There are, I mean, what is green revolution? Improved seeds, fertilizer, and herbicides, irrigation water when the farmer needs it. It's not just irrigation water, but when the farmer needs it. And we heard about extension services, agronomic practices. That's the green revolution as my brother articulated in his opening remark to this segment, how come we have so much green areas on the continent with no revolution, even though the miracle is clear? And so it brings me back now to the fragility issue, but fragility in terms of climate and fragility, more importantly, in terms of insecurity. If you ask finance ministers, central bank governors of Africa right now, what keeps them awake at night? Likely, many of them will say the burgeoning external debt is, is a major one. But not far behind, there is one line item in the budget of many of our countries that is ballooning. And that's 
expenditure on security. If you don't have security, it doesn't matter what else we talk about in terms of the technology, in terms of you, you cannot food, you know, shockproof agriculture. And so I think at the global level, at the macro level of the AU, we had the, the lady from AU NEPAD here this morning and many others who have, who are in positions of trust and responsibility across our continent and in international organization. I really would think that the best way, the most effective way to shock proof uh, food insecurity is really to tackle the issue of fragility across our continent. Without that, it's going to be very, very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we just keep building this picture of Merci, uh, merci beaucoup. Nous avons là uh, dressé le tableau des différents éléments de complexité dans tous ces défis. Alors uh, ici aux Nations Unies, nous devons quant à nous apporter une solution des Nations Unies et c'est pourquoi j'ai le grand plaisir d'inviter le dernier intervenant, c'est l'économiste en chef du PAM. Merci. Je vous remercie de l'occasion que vous m'avez donnée. Right? And uh, in 2020, we helped about 116 million people, which was a record in our 60-year history. 2021, 128 million. This year, between 140 to 150 million. So certainly, lots and lots of this, these individuals in Africa, and it certainly doesn't bode well. Now, the very key question which comes is that we heard it even here and from before, we know what to do. It's not an issue of not knowing. It's almost like a recipe. I mean, I will name you some things which are like automatic in my head. First, invest in women. Not because it sounds great, but because it's 50% of your labor force. Two, invest in children. Why? We say, oh, you know, uh, first 1,000 days are critically important to get into the you know, highest uh, productivity level, and then we don't invest in children. What does that mean in a globalized world where we all play together? Third, invest in infrastructure. You need the roads, you need, I can tell you from South Sudan and many, many places, as World Food Program, we build roads to move food, right? And suddenly markets mushroom up. Suddenly distances to the health center shrink. And we did it not because we thought of that, we did it because we had to move food. So if you give people the opportunity by building this infrastructure, they will do the rest. It is about increasing the opportunity sets of individuals. And frankly, the fourth one to me, which is really important is in Western countries in the United States, when there is a recession, what do we do? We give tax credit back to the poorest people. Why? Because they spend. And when they spend, that creates economic activity, jobs and all of that. Why is that any different in Africa? Why can't we put money into the grassroots? So then the private sector comes. Private sector is not going to come if nobody has anything to pay for or, or buy, right? So how do we make this community attractive to the private sector? which then puts pressure on the governments to build a rural infrastructure, to build the public sector. And these are the things, I'm not just saying it's coming from my head. These are the things which have been done by countries who have beaten poverty, who have beaten hunger in Africa and elsewhere, big countries and small countries. But you know what? All of this will not happen if one, you don't have political commitment. Two, you don't have sustained investment. And three, you don't have coordination, whether in government or with international and everybody else. If we all keep doing our own things, these people who rely on us, if we talk about resilience, we're not gonna build resilience at the individual level or community level or the country level. All of these things need to happen. 
And frankly, not for one day or one week or for one month, it doesn't help. We got to go in years to get to the place where need need to be. And for me, as a very last thing, we always ask, what will it cost? In our lives also, somebody comes to you with a project, first question is, how much is it going to cost me? Well, can we just change that question around and say, okay, well, how much is it going to cost if I don't do it? If I don't do it, what is the cost of inaction, right? And not the cost of inaction to the person you're talking about, to you. What if I don't do it? Am I going to hurt? And guess what? The answer is going to surprise you. Because if we don't, in a globalized world, when these problems happen, we all pay. Actions and reactions are no longer in the same place. You cannot avoid something saying, oh, it's Africa's problem, or oh, it's somebody else's problem. No, it is our problem. It's just that we pay a little bit later for the same thing, but we pay a thousand times more. Look at Syria and Europe. Look at Central America and the US. There are clear examples of these things. And I think this is what people can take one thing away from this, start thinking about what is the cost of inaction of not doing this, not for them, but for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arif Hossein. And thank you so much to the whole panel. I think uh, with a short amount of time, you all covered such immense and insightful topics. And I think you helped us start thinking through why will change happen now? You know, and I take from this, this panel the, the importance of learning from our past experiences, changing mindsets, really beginning to look at incentives to change uh, and influence behavior, uh, really get into structural change, and of course, really be clear what are the root causes, governance, private sector, international trade, investment in infrastructure, etc. And I think if we really focus on these deep-rooted drivers, we do give ourselves collectively a better chance of actually shifting the needle here. Um, and so with that, I would love to have time for questions. Uh, this really could go on all day, but given, given the time, I will hand back to the chief moderator of this event, uh, Raymond, my colleague. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this again, and Raymond, uh, back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Andrew. Um, excellent job, and thanks. Join me in thanking an excellent panel. I'd just like to let you know that uh, we have a working paper um, called Towards Africa Food Towards Food Security and Sovereignty in Africa, which um, unpacks some of the conversations we've been having today and also presents some preliminary data that we have on prospects for food security and food sovereignty in Africa. If you scan the Q code, you, it will take you to the paper then, but we have limited copies here in the room and if you, they're probably around. But let's, we're gonna close by showing you a video we should have shown earlier, but we had to stop for the interest of time, in the interest of time. But once again, thank you so much to our co-moderators uh, to my co-moderator, thank you to our partners, the AU Development um, um, Agency, and um, Andrew and team, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Today, 320 million Africans are food insecure. This means that one of four Africans struggles to find sufficient food every day. The war in Ukraine and the COVID pandemic highlighted this problem, but the structural challenges underlying Africa's food crisis have persisted for decades. African countries and their development partners are working hard to address the consequent shortfall in the continent's food supply and ensure that vulnerable segments of the population are able to access affordable food. Many African countries have provided food subsidies humanitarian support, and income support to facilitate the importation of essential supplies. However, the problem is more fundamental. A continent with 60% of the world's arable land cannot feed itself. While the answer to this troubling question is complex, 
Africa's inability to boost agricultural yields lies at the core. Fertilizer use provides an illuminating example. Average fertilizer use in Africa has been below 20 kilograms per hectare for many years. This compares unfavorably with a global average of 137 kilograms and the African Union's 2006 target of 50 kilograms per hectare. The continent has the raw material to produce sufficient fertilizers, but most of it is exported to Europe, Asia, and the United States. Furthermore, Africa's 19 fertilizer manufacturing plants and over 100 blending units are operating way below capacity, and some of them import raw materials like potash and urea from outside Africa. Concerted efforts to direct African raw materials to existing manufacturing capacity and connecting affordable fertilizer produced in Africa with African farmers will triple food production by 2025 and guarantee food sovereignty across the continent. Africa can feed itself, but it will take a focused, four-phased campaign. First, African investors must resuscitate the capacity of existing fertilizer plants. Second, African governments must facilitate the trade of African potash and urea to produce fertilizer. Third, African farmers must be guaranteed access to affordable fertilizers. And fourth, African institutions must shift the narrative from food availability to food systems, which will enhance capacity and capabilities in the entire food value chain. This approach to food security in Africa would improve lives, secure livelihoods, create jobs, enhance trade, reduce inflationary pressures from global commodity markets, improve the balance of payments, protect the environment, and moreover, promote the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals.